Hello and welcome everyone. I am Taklai and this is the program in which we speak to people with interesting insights into issues that we believe are important. And the single most important issue that has dominated discourse in Ethiopia and Eritrea for the past couple of weeks is the issue of port access. Two weeks ago, all broadcasters in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia aired a presentation by Abi Ahmed, which had one central message, which was that Ethiopia must acquire port access by any means necessary. Although he didn't make it explicit, there was no doubt that the port of Aseb was the target. The presentation has drawn rebuke from Eritrea, from Somalia, and from Djibouti. Although to de-escalate the fallout, Abiy yesterday said that Ethiopia wasn't planning to invade any country. Amidst this to and fro, there is a palpable fear and feeling that war might be coming. Is it a legitimate fear or is it paranoia? And what does Abiy want to achieve? To help us answer these questions, I have invited Shetil Tronvol. Shetil is a professor at Oslo University College. He's a political anthropologist, conflict advisor, analyst, and has written extensively on the Horn of Africa. Welcome, Shetil. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be with you again. It's my pleasure. So what have you made of what has been happening in Ethiopia and Eritrea following the presentation, Shetil? Well, one thing is um, it's a case which gives and gives in terms of um, developments uh, every week, uh, radical development, new information, um, and uh, also new worrying signs about the possibility of uh, new conflicts on the horizon, so to say. I think um, the concrete case where the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed are uh, first mentioning uh, the very keen interest of Ethiopia to gain access to the sea by all means possible, so to say, um, which he later moderated and saying that, of course, we are not interested to go to war over this issue. We need to negotiate. We need to give and take. We need to find compromises. We need to find different kind of arrangements to ac accommodate Ethiopia's uh, current need, and also certainly to accommodate Ethiopia's future need, uh, projecting the demographic growth in the country and economic uh, expansion of the country. So again, it's the classical Ethiopian ambiguity uh, on uh, on phrasing things. Uh, yes, there is a um, carrot. Uh, in in uh, his um, explanation, but there is certainly also a stick, uh, implicit or explicit threatening to um, gain access to the sea um, by possible political military interventions also. Um, it cannot be read otherwise, uh, although he, he moderates it um, in, in a follow-up statement. And as you um, rightfully said, uh, all the three neighboring countries, uh, Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea, well, also Somaliland for that matter, has um, have um, have uh, rejected the threat, so to say, and and um, clearly uh, said that is a, an um, unwarranted for and, and not accepted uh, in the international relations and international law. Um, but um, Ethiopia and the, the prime minister have um, also reached out to the international community over the last couple of weeks um, with a letter to, um, to um, bilaterals um, claiming that Eritrea is an obstacle in um, reportedly claiming, let me use that phrase, reportedly claiming that Eritrea is an obstacle to the implementation of the Pretoria Agreement in full. Uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, blackmailing the Eritrean position uh, versus the Ethiopian case. Uh, and, and that is also a very interesting development, obviously, which points to the 
certainly the increase of tensions, which we have observed over the last couple of three, four weeks, which is um, which is a natural evolvement of the deteriorating relationship between Asmara and Addis, which we have seen since the signing of the Pretoria Agreement. It's nothing new. This was a quite clearly observable in November last year that the uh, Isaias of Werke were not too happy with uh, the Pretoria Agreement and um, the, um, the peace with the uh, TPLF Tigray. So it is just a um, continuing deterioration of that uh, relationship and then escalating the fear of a potential new conflict, uh, this time uh, not against Tigray, but between Eritrea and Ethiopia potentially. But certainly also then evolving Tigray as Tigray is the border <laughs> with with Eritrea uh, next to the Alpha region. So um, it is an um, uncertain uh, terrain we are entering uh, in the sense that um, I think uh, many plausible scenarios can happen. They are more likely or not, but they are all plausible. And that's uh, that's a worry. Well, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the deterioration of relations between Ethiopia and, and Eritrea. And maybe, you know, we should give listeners a bit of context in terms of the, that journey, what happened in 2018, um, in the days and months um, leading up to the war on Tigray. There seemed to be a tripartite agreement between Ethiopia, um, Eritrea and, and Somalia. And part of the agreement, again, it, it, it's not something that has been made explicit anywhere. Maybe you will, you will tell us um, what you are privy to. But it, it looked like that port access was part of the agreement, part of the tripartite um, agreement. And now we are um, in a situation where the Prime Minister of Ethiopia is having to say th those um, things and Eritrea is having to openly um, reject and rebuke the Prime Minister's overtures so what happened? Why had the relationship deteriorated? Well, I think uh, there are um, two separate tracks or processes we need to look into. Uh, the one you are mentioning is uh, important, but not the most important one, which, the which is the bilateral agreements between Ethiopia and Eritrea in the aftermath of the peace agreement. But let's first address the tripatriot agreement between Isaias Afwerki, Abiy Ahmed, and Formaggio in Mogadishu, uh, because that is more easier to say it is over, <laughs> basically because the changing dynamics in the horn, and basically because Formaggio is no longer in the in the palace in Mogadishu. He's out, and is a new guy in town who has a different perspective on uh, collaboration and cooperation at that level, but. Um, that agreement, uh, the, the tripatriot agreements, which on paper, I say on paper, had the intention to reconfigure the Horn of Africa politically, economically, socially, with a very close-knit integration between these three countries. Uh, they even talked about possibly uh, some kind of uh, union or confederation or federation, whatever, uh, in, in the long run. Uh, that borders should not longer be relevant between these three countries. That dream, that vision is um, is over, uh, certainly. And if it really was realistic to start with, I seriously doubt. Uh, it might be that Abiy Ahmed at that time believed in it because he was rather naive in how to handle Isaias Afwerki. But Isaias never had <laughs> uh, good intentions, in my view, behind that kind of uh, alliance. It was an alliance pragmatically entered into or designed primarily by him, I would say, um, uh, for various reasons. Uh, you know, Isaias has always worked against multilateral fora. He he um, despised the AU and EGAD, uh, and he saw this as a possible uh, new means to marginalize certainly EGAD, but potentially also AU in the Horn of Africa. Um, but that that tripartite alliance is is no longer there, and it will not have um, it, it will not be restored uh, at that um, level of intentions that we saw um, some three or four years back. But I think in more, uh, but part of that, yes, I agree. Part of that was also kind of Ethiopia's uh, need and interest to gain access uh, to uh, both the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. 
uh, and you had um, uh, you had negotiations about uh, port agreements in terms of uh, Ethiopia funding parts of the port expansions, uh, for instance, um, and um, and also the development of certain infrastructure on the Ethiopian side of the border uh, to um, to cater for the use of um, of ports in uh, in Somalia, um, in in that regard. But I think more pertinent and more relevant for the current uh, dynamics and the negative dynamics we see between Eritrea and Ethiopia is the fact that after the friendship agreements entered into between uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia in, um, in July 2018, you had um, a concrete process to follow up to institutionalize this very, very weak so-called peace agreement, friendship agreement. And I know that Ethiopia pushed for uh, further institutionalization of it um, in order to make it more accountable, more predictable, more transparent uh, in economic, social, political security developments between the two countries. And um, at that time, I was interviewing quite a few uh, members of the Ethiopian cabinet uh, in order to uh, hear their views on relinking to Eritrea. As you know, I have um, also a deep Eritrea background in my research, and I still follow up on that. Um, and um, I know for sure that Ethiopia had talks, Ethiopia had the specific uh, negotiating delegations tasked to develop uh, uh, bilateral port agreement with Eritrea, uh, bilateral trade agreement with Eritrea, and also a cross-border trade agreement with Eritrea. And uh, they invited Eritrea to send their delegates uh, so they could sit in others and talk. Eritrea uh, was very hesitant and it didn't come with delegations, it came with a couple of individuals maybe. Um, Ethiopia became impatient, so Ethiopia fulfilled complete the drafts of these three agreements and submitted it to Isaias Awerki for Eritrea's review and comments and then for um, signing and ratification because Ethiopia was really eager to push this. In 2019, uh, these process were ongoing, particularly the spring of 2019. Um, Eritrea didn't respond. Eritrea didn't come back to Ethiopia with comments or with the critical comments or with constructive comments or with the, uh, you know, suggestions for improvement. Eritrea didn't return these three drafts agreement, which were part of the friendship kind of linking up. Um, and um, it fizzled out, it died out. So still, you know, there are no institutionalization of the peace process. I wrote very critically about this in 2019, uh, 2020, the lack, the need to institutionalize the peace. Um, I was very critical exactly in um, around, um, you know, during the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony, for instance, <laughs> the, the, the worrying sign that uh, the peace agreement is still not institutional, institutionalized. Uh, and Abi is receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for it. It is still a very fragile piece. And I wrote a couple of articles exactly on that matter. And, and I think that hesitation from day one, from the Eritrean side, to actually fulfill its obligations to really link up institutionally, is of course, should be a worrying sign already at that time. But he's also the modus operandi of Isaias Afwerki. Isaias Afwerki never wants to commit himself to uh, a transnational, multinational regime of law <laughs> and regulations. Isaias want to be the rough rider, no matter where he goes. And um, it dawned upon Ethiopia too late in that regard. But I think that is what you see coming back again now, when Abi has this very strong position, because he knows he tried to negotiate and a port agreement with Eritrea. He knows he tried to negotiate the bilateral agreements on trade and cross-border operations with Eritrea. Um, he has tried that for, for quite some time without it materializing. So I think that's made him go uh, express himself rather uh, uh, confrontational in that manner uh, uh, with the maybe hope of uh, rocking the boat. I don't know to see what happens. 
but we, we need to bring that backdrop into understanding Ethiopia's and Abi Ahmed's uh, rhetoric of today. Mm -hmm. Well, so so clearly from what you're saying, one reason for the deterioration of relations is because the the, the agreement, insofar as we could we could call it agreement in 2018, has never been um, institutionalized, and that's always a recipe for, for disaster. If if uh, if um, there is a if there is no mechanism for holding mm -hmm. people um, accountable when they renege. And another important factor, um, it seems to me, and actually you, you alluded to it, is the signing of the Pretoria Agreement. Um, clearly, Abi has no, has not made any secret that he felt betrayed um, when it was signed. Isaias, yes, he felt uh, betrayed. And actually, he appeared on TV to, to, to say as, as much. And for, for those reasons, and surely there would be other um, factors, that the relationship seems to have deteriorated beyond... Uh, repair, but one one thing that I would want to know, and I I think our listeners would want to know, is why did Abiy think now is the right time to to make that very very provocative um, speech? Is it because he feels now he's in a strong position? Uh, do you think is that because he feels he has uh, Western support? Uh, I'm surely I think it's reasonable to expect that Abiy wouldn't go into war without making sure that he has Western support. Um, what do you think is the, the, the calculation on the part of Abiy now? Yes, I think, let us first just um, elaborate for the viewers uh, uh, who maybe not know the detail, that Isaias Is Is of Werke was, uh, was uh, very angry at the Pretoria Peace Agreement because that uh, signed off you know, he failed. He, Isaias's main objective to enter into an alliance of war with Abiy Ahmed to crush Tigray was exactly to crush Tigray, was to kill off TPLF, was to annihilate the TPLF leadership and the whole organization from the surface of the earth. That didn't happen. As we know, TPLF is there. TPLF is even running the government of Tigray. TPLF is now in an alliance with the federal government under the Pretoria Agreement. And that is hugely provocative for Isaiah Safwerki as he sacrificed tens of thousands of Eritrean soldiers to reach the objective to finally crush and kill off TPLF one time for all. It didn't happen. And uh, he views the Pretoria Agreement as an agreement to restore TPLF's capacities and capabilities once again. And that is that why that's why the, the, we saw the very very sharply deteriorating relations between Asmara and others after November last year. And then, as you come, why is Albi taking this stand now beyond what, what shall I say beyond the interest of the port? <laughs> because there is a, there are a lot more stakes involved than than the port access for for Abiy Ahmed and Ethiopia, obviously. I think you see the. It, and it has to relate to the domestic affairs in Ethiopia, first and foremost. Uh, the situation in Amhara regional state, the Amhara rebellion, the Fano rebellion, call it whatever you want. Uh, it is a challenge for Ethiopia. It is a challenge not only for the Amhara region and stability in Amhara region. It's just, if we're talking about the stability of Ethiopia as such. And uh, there are very clear indications and reports that uh, they receive assistance from Eritrea. Um, and uh, so Isaias is again playing the game he has played for 30 years or even longer the, um, to destabilize the region so he can maneuver. He has destabilized Sudan, he has destabilized Somalia, he has destabilized Ethiopia over and over and over again. And it's, it's just turning the clock on that. Nothing surprising in it, nothing new in it. But of course, it is very provocative for Abi Ahmed, who trusted Abi <laughs> in a sense of an alliance. Uh, as an ally, uh, political ally and a security ally, no, Isaias has turned on Abi in terms of destabilizing Abi's regime and control of the Ethiopian territory. And Abi uh, and Eritrea is still occupying Ethiopian sovereign territory, parts of Tigray. And um, Abi finally, I think, has to take a stand on that too. 
And so, so it is connected to the interest as viewed from Addis Ababa that we need to return to possibly TPLF's old strategy of containment. The only way to handle Isaias, if not to kill him off, is to contain him. And we need to box him in again to a certain degree. And I think that's also part of uh, what we see today, that Abi has finally dawned upon Abi and finally dawned upon his government and his advisors, <laughs> who I know, many of, who doesn't know anything of Eritrea in terms of history, ideology, Sarasakweki. I've been speaking to them. They have a very shallow understanding of Eritrea. That finally they see the true of the true Isaiah Sahwerki. And um, possibly they regret that they kicked out all Tigrayans, all TPLF guys from the MFA and from the security sector. Uh, rumors are that they are inviting them back in again now, exactly to have a steeper learning curve on how to handle Isaiah Sahwerki in Eritrea. Because that knowledge is kept by TPLF and Tigray. Not only language-wise, cultural-wise, but, but also operational, going back to the 70s and 80s uh, and, and, and the resistance struggle. So um, that has to be factored in. And then your third element, in the sense of, uh, is, is, is Abiy Ahmed doing this um, out of the blue, without consent, implicit by some Western actors or by some international actors? Does he have a backing? Um, I would say that if, if Ethiopia is daring or is uh, actually challenging Eritrea militarily and achieving the downfall of Isaiah Sakwerki's regime, everyone in the West will applaud them, but not officially, obviously. Officially, formally, it will be condemned because it is a breach of international law. Certainly, and it should be condemned. But no one will protest of the removal of Isaiah Sahwerki from Eritrea. No one. So that is there too, yeah. And how explicit this has been communicated from Addis to its Western allies, I don't know. But I'm sure that there are unofficial communication to certain levels between certain partners, yes. Yeah, but I think what you said in terms of what the thinking would be from Western corners is, is right, that they would condemn um, an invasion from Ethiopia um, publicly, but that um, internally they wouldn't be too angry about that. Um, one reason that might change that thinking would be that they wouldn't have confidence on the ABU regime to go and and squash um, um, Eritrea. Uh, this is, we're talking about a an, an army that can't even contain a rebellion in the Amhara region, and they, mm -hmm. they are not the most organized. So there is, a, there is always an issue there, whether or not ABU has the competence to, to do that sort of undertaking. Um, Certainly, and, and, but let, let me right. clarify. I, I, I didn't say they would give him the go-ahead. Not at all. Yeah. But uh, after a potential removal of Isaias, they will publicly say, shame on you, condemn it. But unofficially, they will communicate something else. Yeah. And the point is, but I didn't mention exactly the, another reason, since you alluded to that now, which might motivate Abiy Ahmed, is, the, is exactly these issues, the internal issues. <laughs> And uh, and uh, and uh, the fact, as we also know, that uh, once Ethiopia are meeting a foreign aggression, once Ethiopia feels a threat from a foreign element, Ethiopia also somehow rallies around the flag of nationalism, and certainly from the political sector, which today is challenging Abiy the most, the Amhara pan-Ethiopianist sector. <laughs> uh, it would be very hard, although I hear some Amhara colleagues and others say that if it is a war between Abiy and Isaias, we will support Isaias. Uh, I don't really believe in that. I don't really believe in that. I think uh, exactly the, the 
the sentiment of Ethiopian nationalism, the sentiment of who has argued for Ethiopia's right to take back Assam? Who has argued for Ethiopia's right to bring Eritrea back to the motherland for 35 years? It's exactly the segments which are now fighting against Abi. <laughs> so if Abi goes to war on Eritrea with that intention, it will be very hard for them to revise 35 years of history and argumentation they have projected. So I think that might also be there to lure Abi Ahmed into doing something. But let me state from the very, very explicitly, I am totally against any kind of armed intervention from Ethiopia's side on Eritrea, although I would love to see Isaias of Werke go, as everyone will, but it should never ever be by war. And again, it's also up to the Eritrean people to fix their own problem. It is not up to Ethiopia to fix their problem. And a war from Ethiopia on Eritrea will certainly cement Isaias's power and will also evoke a tremendous nationalism in Eritrea, which again is threatened by Ethiopia's dominance, which they have been over and over and over again. So we, as you say, it will not be an easy match for Ethiopia to conquer Eritrea, not at all. But a war on Eritrea, a war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, will be a war of attrition, as we saw Ethiopia's war on Tigray. And then there is a numbers game. Eritrea is 3.5 million people. Ethiopia is 120 million. It's, it's, it, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to make that calculation, but then there's a war of attrition. And, uh, and the sad thing will be, if it is an attack, if it is a com armed confrontation, then, of course, Tigray will be directly pulled into it, and TDF and the Tigrayan people will be pulled into it as actors of war once again. And that might... Um, satisfy certain demands in, uh, in Tigray in terms of uh, getting even or getting back, but it is also will be a tragedy on Tigray, which will suffer once again uh, as a main battlefield. Then you will have two battlefields. One is Assab, which certainly will be the ENDF's main target, but you will also have Asmara, which will be then go through Tigray, which will be the TDF's <laughs> main uh, uh, front line. So, so it is. It's 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 a terrible scenario we're talking about, both for the Eritrean people, for the Tigrayan people, for the Ethiopian people, if it goes to that length. And I'm worried that it actually might do so, but we'll have to wait and see. Well, thank you for that um, excellent clarification, um, Shetil. Um, uh, you, you're right to take the time to clarify because we, we don't want to give the impression that you, we are pushing for one. Definitely, you're not pushing for for, for war. Um, but you mentioned the TPLF, Shetel, and you say that one of the reasons why Isaias is boiling with anger, I think that's it's fair to put it that way, is the TPLF hasn't been finished off and he feels betrayed, um, Isaias, because that hasn't happened, given mm. that that was his main uh, objective, Why one of the reasons why he went into that agreement. But of course, we, we're talking about a TPLF that has been really, really... Um, weakened, um, immiserated, and diminished. It's not the TPLF of, of the old um, days. It's not the TPLF that has a sense of um, agency. And I think one thing that a lot of our listeners, especially those from Tigray, would want to know is how does the TPLF read the, the current dynamic? Um, what should the, the, the position of the TPLF in, in Makale, given that it's not a TPLF that has a degree of autonomy, how does it navigate these very, very tricky waters? If, if you have some views on that, that would be, that would be, uh, that would be fantastic. Well, I will be very careful to speak in much detail on this since I haven't been back to Tigray for it for some time. I'm, I'm struggling to get back in. Um, so, um, uh, but we do see the point you raise is uh, in, in one aspect, we have a weakened TPLF in the sense that TPLF is divided. Uh, the political elites in Tigray, meaning the TPLF, is divided uh, between the interim government, between the TDF leadership, and between the party leadership. And the party leadership is again fractionized in different components. 
And that is a new situation in, um, in Tigray, and both uh, Dr. De Brezion and Gitacho Reda have uh, acknowledged that in their public speeches over the last few weeks. Um, and uh, also Tadej Severga and the TDF leadership has acknowledged that, Sadgam, uh, and so on. So that is not the secret. Uh, the point is, if they will manage to come together, as they promised they will, <laughs> Uh, to consolidate and to have a coherent um, uh, approach to the tremendous challenges facing Tigray, both internally, in terms of security, in terms of humanitarian issues, in terms of development, economy, everything, and they need to be on the same page, but also certainly in terms of um, the external threats against them. And most directly, Eritrea, but also uh, Fano, Amhara actors, but also uh, the federal level to a certain degree. Yes, they are uh, an ally <laughs> with the federal government now under the Pretoria Agreement. Uh, we see how um, the power alliances are re re reconfigured every week, so to say, but now it is a new pattern uh, clearly emerging uh, and where um, TPLF are in a position where they actually need to back Abiy Ahmed if Abiy Ahmed goes to war. And that might be troublesome, uh, that that is the new war alliance, is TPLF, uh, ENDF, TPLF, Mekele, Addis. Um, so far, and I think that's a very, very wise strategy, so far um, the interim government have clearly expressed that they will not participate in uh, crushing the Fano rebellion. Uh, that's not their task. Uh, but it is also a question for how long Mekele can sit idle uh, and not uh, be on the ground in Vestigrai, for instance, um, which is still unclear. Uh, the, the transition of Vestigrai back to the administrative authority of Mekele uh, and, and the follow-up of that, which certainly will involve um, some uh, contested issues versus Amhara political actors, uh, both Bahidar, Fano, and also the new administration under Colonel Demeke uh, in, in West Tigray. Um, so um, I think... Uh, the and as you know that the if TPLF and the interim government and the TDF leadership manage to come together to uh, hammer out a more consolidated joint coherent strategy, will that resonance with the people of Tigray? We know there have been a quite a few expressions of grievances from uh, the ordinary people of Tigray versus the interim government, versus the TPLF leadership. And how, so I'm, I'm possibly more worried about that. I can, I can we can uh, project that TPLF will manage to reconsolidate its um, power once again but will that be aligned with the genuine interest of the Tigrayan people? I think it is worthwhile raising that question, considering the history of the party. Hmm. Yeah, this is um, it's a, it's a very volatile um, situation, the, the Tigray situation. So um, I understand why you are trying to work very um, carefully. Um, Returning to to Abiy Shetil um, and his his, um, his his push for for port access, one of the things he said is that Ethiopia can't really develop or grow without port access. That that seemed to be one of the main sort of points that he he, he was trying to 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 make. And. Of course, my 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 gut feeling is that port access is very very important. But I I also think that you know someone like Meles would sort of disagree that they would say that or actually Ethiopia could find a workable arrangement 
even without having port, uh, port access of its own. It could, it could, um, it could work with Djibouti, with Somalia, with um, Eritrea, and that would just be fine. It wouldn't be an obstacle. I think that would be something that they would say. Whereas Abiy seemed to be saying that it's, it's a matter of you know life or death, um, and that we we Ethiopia must make sure that it has port access of its own. Um, how how do you see that argument from from, from Abiy? Is he, is he right when he's when he says that it's, it's, it's just something that ETPM must do anything um, at its disposal to to acquire? I think from a purely political, economic, security aspect, I think it holds a grain of truth because the volatile situation in Somalia and Eritrea because of the regime's nature in these two countries, because of their unpredictability, both in terms of uh, long-term policy planning, but also in terms of will they stay around the long-term <laughs> and their interests are shifting, changing uh, rapidly. Ethiopia cannot rely on cannot rely 100% on only a written agreement because it is no guarantee that Isaias will change his uh, position tomorrow if he make an agreement today. He will most certainly, more likely, change his position tomorrow even though he has an agreement today. So from that perspective, you can say Abi is right that Ethiopia would need a control a security, administrative, political control of the outlet in order to safeguard their interest and need to grow, so to say, economically uh, because of the weight of the country demographically and economically. If the situation had been different, if the neighboring countries had been democratic and peaceful and transparent and accountable, then it's okay. Then you make it a long-term agreement. Over 100 years or 200 years for that matter, a lease agreement or whatever kind of port access agreement. Uh, and you can trust that. And then you can plan accordingly. You cannot do that in the Horn of Africa today because you cannot trust your neighbors. And I think, you know, from a real politic perspective, we have to have and we have to understand that argument. Again, not condoning it, <laughs> understanding it. Uh, I think there are means and ways, obviously, for Ethiopia to secure and to safeguard their long-term interest. But um, that has to come after some regime changes in the neighboring countries <laughs> and some long-term stability projection in Somalia, for instance. Yeah. Djibouti is a different matter. Djibouti can be handled. It is a rather stable regime. It's not a democratic accountable regime, not at all, uh, but it has provided to be stable. But for how long? Uh, you know, how long can the Gulen regime keep control as they have done? And uh, Djibouti is congested. It, it is not. It is. It is not enough for Ethiopia to rely on one outlet. And Ethiopia has 120 million today, 125 million projected to be 150 million in in 2030, and continue to grow. So. Uh, that is a that is it is a serious concern that Ethiopia is the biggest landlocked country in the world in terms of population size, uh, and with huge aspirations to to evolve radically in terms of industrialization. So you know, from that perspective, there are some valid points in what Abe is is saying. Yeah. Yeah. Just to to add one thing, Shetil, uh, um, listening to Abi's presentation, it, it, it you get the impression that. What he wants is not just um, harbor or port access, but also a coastal land, because he, he was also speaking about irrigation and and um, and uh, even tourism. Yes. Um, so there is more to it than a, a simple yeah. quest for, for port. Um, yeah, he, he 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 and that's it. That's interesting. Again, then <laughs> the way he projects it is not. And that's a very good point. Actually, it's not only port access. It is um, implicit in what he's saying. It is um, the right to territorial waters, the right to fishing and potential resources 
which Ethiopia would need to feed its uh, people and potentially also other resources. It is um, a navy and a, a navy base, obviously. Uh, they're already planning their navy, um, Ethiopia, in order again to safeguard Ethiopia's um, security interests beyond their own borders and uh, and um, trade interests and you know supply line interests so there is there is another level of ambition hidden in abis uh, vision of a port i agree with you and i think that is also something uh, which makes it more worrying uh, in terms of uh, stability and uh, in terms of increased threats and increased risk of uh, uh, armed confrontation somewhere down the road. Mm. Well, so that is in terms of the importance of, of port, and you seem to believe that there is an element of truth to what Abiy is saying. Um, and one of the sort of the whole thing from Abiy's perspective hinges on the on the on the argument that Ethiopians have been pushing for for for, for decades, really, which is that Ethiopia has a historical right. And I don't quite know what exactly that, that means. What does it mean for, for a country to have a historical right over an asset that belongs to another sovereign country? So it's, it's something that I, I want you to reflect on. Is that a sort of personal interest, really? I, I don't quite grasp again, what it means. Yes, exactly. And I think that's that's why it is worthwhile for, um, if there are any international uh, ambassadors or, or, or diplomats uh, listening in, so to say, that they should really read uh, the transcript of Abi's speech, speeches on these issues, because there is a lot hidden in that, and uh, and I think there is a lot of interesting historical uh, elements he he revitalizes, so to say, and makes relevant again today to claim that right. For instance, the way he talks about both the Afar um, homelands and the Somali homelands. Uh, that uh, since uh, the Afars are uh, primarily uh, located territorially and demographically in Ethiopia, but then with the coastal strip in Eritrea and parts of Djibouti. And he goes back to um, the Derg uh, revision of the Derg province, of, of the Ethiopian provinces uh, and administrative regions the Derg did in uh, 1988, uh, after the Ethiopian new constitution in 87, where they established the Afar um, administrative region, uh, including then the Red Sea Afar, Ethiopian Afar uh, province, which was the latest, which of course was a means for the Derg that time to break up the Eritrean uh, administrative entity in terms of weakening EPLF's uh, independence struggle, you can say. But according to international law, uh, it also makes a, a case in claiming which TPLF, EPRDF didn't utilize in 1991 or 1993, that if um, that um, it, it is the latest provincial or domestic administrative borders, which should be put to ground in addressing um, successor states that the new EPRDF regime. Uh, EPRDF uh, accepted the old province of Eritrea, not the new province of Eritrea, as Derg had made. Yeah? Uh, Abi goes back to that, and he goes back to the natural uh, intrinsic rights of the Afar people to stay together as a polity, somehow. And if the Afar's natural intrinsic right to stay together as a polity is put on the table, means that, well, you have access to the Red Sea, because then the whole Eritrean coast belongs to the Afar, and the Afar belongs to Ethiopia. And so Ethiopia has that. And the same goes with the argument to Somalia. And, and you know, in a way, he he uh, revamps pan-Somalia nationalism, which Ethiopia crushed in 77-78 in the Somali-Ethiopian war, uh, when Somali forces wanted to reclaim Ogaden to Somalia proper. Uh, he goes back again to that and saying that Somalis are both in Somalia, Somaliland, Djibouti, and Ethiopia, and we have to think about them as one people, and one people needing access to the sea, Meaning Ethiopian Somalis needs access to the sea. Meaning Ethiopia needs access to right, rightful access to the sea coast 
or Somalia as such. So, you know, it's um, very interesting <laughs> the way he raises these issues, which at the same time he believes is an ad, is, is, is an argument to underpin Ethiopia's intrinsic rights to the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. But it is the same time an argument um, of irredentism against Ethiopia. <laughs> it's an argument that the Afars and Somalis can break out, so to say, and establish their own countries, uh, weakening or, or you know, uh, disintegrating Ethiopia. <laughs> So it's 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 again this ambiguous way of uh, uh, packing together an argument which can be used in 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 multiple directions, so to say. Hmm. Well, th those um, arrangements involving people and, and land uh, and generally negotiations, um, I think that th these are things that could be had when the the parties are engaged in good faith, hmm. um, which I don't think is the case in in Ethiopia and Eritrea now. Um, Abiy, as as you said, is openly intimidating. Um, Eritrea and Isaias is not someone who takes too kindly to to intimidation. Um, so I I have my reservations uh, about the possibility for, for any sort of reasonable uh, negotiation, mm. um, Shetil. Mm. But um, what, one one final point, and I, I don't want to put you on on the spot, but is there any precedent for, for that sort of arrangement where countries sort of trade in land and maybe you know rearrange territories to um, to reach an agreement on 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 port and um, stuff like that? Yes, if if the two sovereign governments are consenting on the land swapping, that I get that part of your land and you can get that part of my land, that's okay. They can do that if they're two sovereign uh, countries and they are um, legitimate governments signing off on that. And and that is also raised by Abiy, for instance, in his in his speak. And uh, or other kind of arrangements of uh, uh, getting a um, minority share in Ethiopian airlines, in the Gur Dam, in other Ethiopian assets, so to say, which, uh, you know, obviously, if it was a um, economic rational calculating regime in Asmara, they would happily part with, if not Assam, at least with a minimum stretch of their coastline, which are unproductive anyway, because these coastal offers are more or less prohibited for uh, to undertake uh, fishing activities in the Red Sea because the regime doesn't trust them. <laughs> Uh, in case of what they can smuggle in or smuggle out. Uh, so, um, and Eritrea could cash in significantly on giving away an unproductive stretch of their coastline to Ethiopia, if they so wished. Uh, so, but of course, the Eritrean regime is not a calculating economic regime. It's a purely nationalistic, military-driven uh, conspiracy uh, paranoia regime. Uh, so they, 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 they would never enter into that kind of talks and negotiations, as you say. Uh, and um, we have to wait. And I think Ethiopia should be a bit patient uh, instead of squandering off uh, some um, hundred thousands new soldiers to be killed in the war. They should be patient because Isaias is getting old. Isaias will not live forever. So wait five, 10 years, he will be gone, no matter. And hopefully you will have a more uh, accountable, transparent uh, regime in Eritrea, which will take the country into a transition where you can have negotiated agreement with the government, which represent the people of Eritrea. <laughs> and the people of Eritrea will like to live with peace with Ethiopia. And in order to achieve, and would like development and, 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 um, and uh, social, cultural, political security interactions with Ethiopia. And that will hopefully happen post this IAS. And, and, and then these agreements potentially can be made. Well, but I'm well, not sure we will have that patience. Yeah, well, what I was going to say that you say that Ethiopia should be patient, but patience um, patience isn't a quality that you associate with um, with Abiy's very rash 
Uh, it's very yeah. unpredictable and erotic. And mm -hmm. actually, one problem, and I, I suppose it would be a problem to, to his Western backers as well, is that it's very difficult to, to, to pin him down on what he's trying to say. So, for instance, in the presentation, at times... Um, he he seemed to be saying that Ethiopia was going to uh, pursue the, the issue of port using peaceful means, and at other times you, you he gives you the impression that he's preparing for for war. Mm -hmm. um, at other times he seems to be alluding to just port access, and then he seems to be saying that it's coastal land that he wants. So it's it's not coherent, it's not properly thought through, and I think that would be a problem to people who are trying to figure out what it is that he's trying to to say. But um, we're yeah. we're running out of yeah we're running out of um, time, Shetil. Can I All comment right, yeah, just on yeah. that uh, before you close? Uh, because I think that is uh, it goes both ways. I think you are correct in saying that it's hard to pin down what his actual strategy is. And that's part of his strategy, <laughs> to be that's difficult to be boxed in. And he's, he's very tactical in that regard, which is clever. Yeah. But, so there's a method There's a method to his um, unpredictability. Yeah, that's certainly a good point. Certainly, it is. But on the other end, the Western diplomats and observers in general, uh, and I, I can generalize a bit on this because I've been around for 35 years in Ethiopia and Eritrea, and I remember... Clearly, in 97, uh, when I started to make warnings about a new war potentially between Eritrea and Ethiopia, I was uh, ridiculed and, uh, and uh, called an alarmist. In 2019, 2020, when I started to warn about a new war against Tigray, I was ridiculed and called an alarmist because Western diplomats and observers generally interpret Ethiopia and Eritrea as rational political actors according to Western rationality, according to our rationality. And that's a fundamental mistake Western diplomats do when interpreting Isaias and Ethiopia. It is rational. They are rational actors, but they don't follow our Western rationality. They have other parameters defining their rational landscape. And hence, we don't want to see what is happening because it doesn't fit our parameters of rationality. The argument, for instance, I've heard over and over again that Eritrea and Ethiopia cannot go to war, cannot use arms because they cannot afford it economically. It's the most stupid argument I know because economy is not part of the fraction when they calculate if they're going to go to war or not. Is based on other premises. And that's exactly what we see today too, which I'm afraid of, that the Western observers don't really take this seriously because they still produce that argument. They cannot afford it. I said, forget that argument. It is not relevant in the decision-making process. Yeah. And that's, that's why we should be very well, very much aware of and very much nervous what's happening in Ethiopia and Eritrea today. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point, um, Shetel. I think one problem is that people like you are very knowledgeable and very nuanced, and you understand the ins and outs of what's happening in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And when you speak and write, you are doing so from, position, from a position of knowledge. Uh, but my, my sense is that most Western commentators and diplomats generally aren't um, that informed. Uh, and so when someone like you raises the, the alarm, for instance, they, they are alarmed by, you, by, 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 by what you are saying, although you are more likely to be right than, than them. Uh, and th I think that is at the root of, of the problem. Um, so as I said in my introduction, Shetil, you are, you, know, you are an expert on Ethiopia, on Eritrea. You have written a lot. You follow developments very, very keenly. Um, I don't want you to ask you to predict the future because that's a foolish errand and that's unwise. But generally, what do you what do you think um, is is going to be the likely outcome of of this particular episode with respect to the to the port? Yeah, 
predicting the future is not the uh, is not the work of an I guess, academic or scholar. Uh, that's the work of the fortune teller. But uh, I think uh, based on the history, on uh, the precedents of what we have seen in the Horn of Africa over the last thirty five years or longer for that matter, when I'm talking about the current regimes in power, uh, I think we should be very worried. I think we should be very, very worried of what's to come. And I think it will be much worse before it improves again. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Sheth. That was that from me. If there is um, a, a message that you want to convey, and there's always a message to convey on issues related to the Horn of Africa, please um, feel free. Otherwise, that would that for me. Thank you. I uh, I know the, the 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 concern is that there are too much happening in in the world these days. In Ukraine, uh, the big big war as viewed from uh, Europe and US. In Gaza, Palestine, uh, the second biggest issue, uh, or maybe the most important issue. And what's happening in Ethiopia and uh, in a peripheral state as Eritrea hardly reaches the headlines anywhere in the world. And that's the tragedy of it, but that's also the reality of it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Shetha, thank you for your time and um, have a wonderful day. And to our listeners, thank you for, for listening to us. That was Shetha Tron a professor at um, um, Oslo New University College. Uh, please follow him on Twitter. He tweets a lot on Ethiopia on Eritrea and he writes articles, he has research papers. So if you really want to understand um, the Horn of Africa, I strongly recommend uh, to read um, his, his um, output. And um, that was that for today and bye-bye.